Today, I'm talking about myasthenia gravis for our monthly chronic disease spotlight, August edition. So myasthenia gravis is a chronic autoimmune disorder in which antibodies destroy the communication between nerves and muscle, resulting in weakness of the voluntary muscles of the body, especially those that control the eyes, mouth, throat, and limbs. So this leads to the symptoms that are most often associated with MG, including visual problems like drooping eyelids, also called ptosis, and double vision or diplopia. And these symptoms are associated with ocular myasthenia gravis. There can also be trouble swallowing or pronouncing words due to the facial muscles being very weak or involvement causing a mask-like appearance or a smile that may appear even like a snarl. And this is related to generalized myasthenia gravis. And then we can also see muscle weakness in general and fatigue, which may vary and change rapidly and in, in intensity over days or even hours and worsen as the muscles are used. And this is called early fatigue. Flare-ups and remissions or the easing of symptoms may occur now and then as well. Uh, remissions, however, are rarely permanent or complete, unfortunately. The disease can strike anyone at any age, but is more frequently seen in young women age 20 to about 30 and men age 50 or older. And your doctor can usually diagnose MG based on your symptoms and certain tests. And a common way to do this is to test how you respond to certain medications. Muscle weakness often dramatically improves for a brief time when someone is given an anticholinesterase medication. So first, let's go over what acetylcholine does in the body because this will make it easier to understand how this plays a role when we give anticholinesterase medications. Probably easiest to do that. So acetylcholine is the chief neurotransmitter of the parasympathetic nervous system, which does things like contract smooth muscle, dilate blood vessels, increases bodily secretions, and slows heart rate. So basically we need acetylcholine for our nerves to communicate with our muscles. And cholinesterase inhibitor drugs stop or inhibit enzymes from breaking down acetylcholine when it travels from one cell to another. So again, if you respond to the medicine, it confirms myasthenia gravis. The most commonly used anticholinesterase drug is called mestinon. Another test that's used is an endrophonium test. So endrophonium is a drug that also prevents the breakdown of acetylcholine, allowing the clinician to understand muscle responses and whether the results are consistent with an MG diagnosis. Other tests, in addition to the ones that I've already mentioned so far, include very specific blood testing, uh, which look for certain very specific antibodies that may be present in people with MG, uh, seronegative myasthenia gravis is a perfect example of this where autoantibodies, namely anti-ACHR and anti-musk autoantibodies are not detectable in the blood. So let's talk about the ACHR antibody and this stands for acetylcholine receptor. And this is one blood test that detects whether this abnormal antibody is present or not. If not, then the patient is diagnosed with seronegative MG as mentioned above. 
and approximately 85% of people diagnosed with MG will test positive for this group of antibodies. And then there is anti-musk antibody testing. And no, this is not for people who just don't like Elon Musk. This is another very specific blood test for those who have tested negative for the acetylcholine antibody or ACHR. There's also genetic testing, uh, which, you know, we can look for conditions that may run in families. However, MG is not inherited and it is not contagious. I just wanted to make sure I clarify that. Next on the list of common testing um, are nerve conduction studies, also known as repetitive nerve stimulation. And this is applying electrical shocks basically to gauge muscle response and action potential and whether results again are consistent with an MG diagnosis. An electromyelogram or EMG, which is a test that measures the electrical activity of a muscle and this detects neuromuscular transmission defects by recording action potentials from individual muscle fibers using a small needle electrode. So this is the test that people most often associate with MG. And lastly, there is something called an ice pack test. So these are examinations performed by specialists to evaluate strength and recovery uh, responses of muscles in the eyeballs. And an ice pack is basically applied to the drooping eyelid for two minutes. And then the drooping or the ptosis is measured with a ruler before and after cooling where a rise in, I believe it's two millimeters, is considered a positive result. Now, as far as treatment, the goal is to ultimately increase muscle function and prevent swallowing and breathing problems. Most people with this condition can improve their muscle strength and lead normal to near normal lives. However, in more severe cases, help may be needed in the breathing and eating departments. First line treatment is typically medications such as acetylcholinesterase medications, as we discussed earlier. Uh, steroids also play a huge role or medicine that can suppress the immune system like immunosuppressives, basically like rituxin or Celsept. And your doctor may also speak to you about a surgical procedure, uh, which is called a thymectomy. And this is a surgical removal of the thymus gland. And if you're not sure how the thymus plays a role in the immune response, check out our, our crash course video. I'll, I'll link it somewhere around here. I never know where, if I'm pointing, I never know where the video is gonna wind up in editing, so just bear with me. So anyway, the role of the thymus gland in MG is not fully understood, and the thymectomy actually may or may not improve symptoms. However, it reduces symptoms in more than 70% of people who do not have cancer of the thymus, possibly by altering the immune system's response basically. So, you know, it's, it's difficult to say. I know plenty of people that have had it and have done well. Another potential treatment is plasmapheresis, a procedure that removes abnormal antibodies from the blood and replaces the blood with normal antibodies from donated blood. Uh, I also did another video on IVIG versus plasmapheresis, so you can also check that out. I'll link it somewhere around here. Immunoglobulin is next, and it's a blood product that helps decrease the immune system and its attack on the nervous system. It is given intravenously and has a tremendous anti-inflammatory effect. It's just IVIG is widely used for the treatment of MG. 
Uh, the cause of MG is unknown and there is no cure, but early detection and prompt medical management can make all of the difference. Complications of myasthenia gravis, the biggest and most serious one is a myasthenia, myasthenia crisis. Um, and this is evidenced by extreme muscle weakness, particularly of the diaphragm and chest muscles, and they support breathing. Breathing actually may become shallow or ineffective, and the airway may actually become blocked because of weakened throat muscles and a buildup of, of secretions. And this crisis may be triggered by a lack of medicine or by other factors such as a respiratory infection or emotional stress, surgery even, or some other, other type of stress. Um, in severe crisis, a person may have to be placed on a ventilator to help with breathing until muscle strength actually returns with treatment. Precautions which may help to prevent or minimize the occurrence of a myasthenia crisis include taking anticholinesterase medications 30 to 45 minutes before meals to reduce the risk of aspiration, which is basically where food is swallowed or and enters the lung passages. Um, taking anticholinesterase medications exactly as prescribed to help maintain the strength of breathing muscles is also very huge, huge, hugely important. Avoiding crowds and contact with people with respiratory infections such as the cold or flu, flu season's coming up, or even COVID. Uh, taking in proper nutrition to maintain optimal weight and muscle strength is really the last one too. So ultimately, this is a very serious disease and can be extremely debilitating for those diagnosed with it. I am a big advocate for MG patients and urge anyone who may be touched by this in any way to check out the following support foundations that I, I'm going to list below and link, but they include the Myasthenia Gravis Foundation of America, the Myasthenia Gravis Rare Disease Network, MG Hope Foundation, Conquer Myasthenia Gravis, uh, the MG Association, there's another one called My Aware, and finally the Muscular Dystrophy Association, which works to support adults and children with all types of neuromuscular disease, including myasthenia gravis. So this wraps up our August chronic disease spotlight. And let me know in the comments down below if you or a loved one has MG and how you manage it. You know, I know, I know, I talk to people every day with it. Very brave people. And check out some of our other videos on MG uh, and or if you want a good laugh, check out these videos below. Uh, you know, here I reminisce about one of my funniest home care experiences and here I play overrated, underrated with my daughter. Good times. Good times. <laughs> so stay healthy and lucid and I will see you.